So, we will begin with another lecture uh, that is concerned with module 7 of this uh, video course on electronic systems packaging and as you have seen in the previous lectures con uh, concerning this module, we are discussing component assembly, materials for assembly and joining methods in electronics. When we say joining methods, uh, typically we are looking at soldering process because as you know um, in the previous modules we have had a glimpse about um, the soldering methods and also methods that can replace soldering for example, conductive adhesives is one method that is being used to join uh, a flip chip or a BGA or a CSP. So, basically there are different joining methods, but we will focus here uh, the mass or volume manufacturing scenario which is soldering. And just to recap, we are discussing surface mount technology, design, fabrication and assembly issues. We will also look at failures library which means we will study what kind of failures that will happen or that can be expected if your process design is faulty. We will also look at materials for assembly and joining methods and also briefly lead free soldering process and the thermal profile issues associated with lead free soldering um, and then uh, environmental issues like replacement materials for lead. In the last class, we have been discussing the case forms of surface mount devices especially chip components like chip capacitors and chip resistors and we have seen how the chip resistor um, is typically uh, reference designated, what kind of case forms it can carry and also what kind of values are depicted by a certain kind of a notation on the resistor in terms of um, reference designations. So, here today we will look at chip capacitors, ceramic multilayer chip capacitors. They are available in a very wide range of values, uh, typically from 0.47 picofarads to 1 microfarad. These values are covered by 7 case forms. So, as, is, as we need to know what a case form is, Typically, um, the case forms can be 1206, 0805, 0603, 0402, 0201 and so on. So, when I say 1206, that means the dimensions of the chip component in this case the capacitor could be 0.12 inches by 0.06 inches and so on for the other case forms. So, uh, it is hoped that you are very clear about the uh, case form notations and this is the similar thing that we have seen in the resistors and in the resistors the uh, ohmic value representation uh, the denotation we have seen how they are depicted on the uh, component. Now, in the case of capacitors, uh, mostly these components are not marked either with digital values or color code. This fact does not represent any problem for the industry where the components are assembled from the roll. Therefore, the technician uh, is really aware of the values of the capacitor at the loading stage itself in the pick and place equipment, but it can be um, a, a, an issue that can be faulty. It can be very dangerous for the service technician to end up with a lot of defects, but an experienced technician can manage in identifying the, the right side of the capacitor and the right value of the capacitor when loading in the pick and place machine. So, be very careful with non-marked items, avoid mixing them, look at the labels that are 
pasted in the rolls or the tape to identify the value of the capacitor and then storage again is very important in the bins of the equipment. It could be a, a small desktop equipment or it could be a huge equipment large volume, but the right storage in the right bin with proper marking is essential. So, here in the case of uh, capacitors again you can see the dimensions of uh, various case forms. For example, here 1206 depicts 3.2 mm by 1.6 mm that is the length and breadth. Height could be from 0.51 to 1.6 mm and the area, the area available for the um, stub or the contact is also given here. So, you can look at such data sheets available uh, and then identify what kind of pads need to be used in the footprint design of a capacitor. Coming to the case of a surface mount device tantalum capacitor, they are available also in different case forms like we have seen uh, with multilayer ceramic capacitors partly without printed values. Therefore, the polarity of such devices where you mark a positive or a negative, in this case the positive is marked by a white line on the device or a white M marking. Okay, this is marked in white, white color printing. The case forms depend uh, on the uh, capacitance value and the nominal voltage supply. The SMD tantalum capacitor standard sizes are denoted here. I can read it for you 3.2 by 1.8 mm, 3.5 by 2.8, 6 by 3.2 and 7.3 by 4.3 and these values are coded with digits or with alphanumerical characters. Now, the coding with digits typically for example, if you have as is mentioned here 224 if this is the coding as we have seen in the case of resistors 22 followed by 4 zeros that is the value of the capacitor. So, the first position gives the first digit of the capacitance value, the second position gives the second digit of the capacitance value and the third position here uh, as an example if it is 4 it means you have to enter 4 zeros and this is the total value in picofarads which is equal to 220 nanofarads or 0.22 microfarads. So, this is an example for you to look at the uh, notation or the marking done on the tantalum surface mount device capacitors. Now, I will explain an important aspect from this uh, two sets of figures. The one on the left here shows the footprint of a QFP package. Okay. This is available from any manufacturer. If you buy a component from um, manufacturer A or B, um, you will get from the website um, or in hard copy the footprint of the surface mount device. So, here what you are seeing is a QFP device quad flat pack. Okay. This is the footprint. So, why do you require a footprint information? Uh, typically, this is the footprint that is established on the printed circuit board where the respective components will come and sit. So, you require to know the actual dimensions of each of the pads. So, in this case you have the quad arrangement. Uh, and then in this particular example, you have um, the quad flat pack pin numbering starting from here, pin number 1 and so on. The dimensions of each of the side is denoted here and the dimensions of uh, each of the pads where the QFP will land is given. Okay. And the pitch of this particular example here is 1 mm, the leads are 44. Okay. So, based on this you can 
identify the total area or the component density of a package and secondly you will use this information to drop your solder paste if you are going in for reflow soldering let us say then you will have to know the pad area available for dispensing your solder paste. In the earlier class we have seen how solder paste is dispensed on the copper pad or the tin plated copper pad and therefore here you have to know the dimensions to adjust the volume of the solder paste. So, knowing the dimensions here you can uh, adjust your syringe dispensing or you can also go in for stencil printing. So, the dimensions or the footprint information is very important for the kind of soldering process that you are engaged in. So, if it is a reflow process then you will dispense solder paste. So, all of you are aware of this, but if you are going in for at any point of time some kind of a alternate like wave soldering then you have to dispense glue. I think you are clear about this. So, the first option is a reflow, the second is a wave. So, in the case of wave you have to dispense the glue to hold the component. So, in that case typically you can dispense the glue at the center of the footprint. In some cases they also dispense additional areas like this to dispense the glue. So, that the component is firmly held during the um, full cure process before it goes for a wave soldering process. Now, whether you actually use a QFP with a pitch of 1 mm for wave soldering or not is another issue, but in some cases where you have hybrid boards and a few SMD components mounted and if you decide on an option for wave soldering then you have to have these kind of uh, information on the printed circuit board during the pre assembly process. Now, on the right side here you see that there are uh, information available for a surface mount device like a resistor or a capacitor. In this case it is a capacitor, it is a 0201 case form which means 0 0.02 inches by 0 0.01 inches. You can see the dimensions given here. This is the top view and this is the printed circuit board view. Now, in this case also you can go in for dispensing the solder paste right on the pad here and then do a reflow process or if you are going in for wave soldering you dispense the glue at the center of the um, area covering the component area on the printed circuit board and then do a complete cure of the glue before it gave, goes for wave soldering. So, this kind of information is very useful. You can upload this information if you are creating a library or a footprint from the CAD package to your assembly process. So, the coordinates are picked from this uh, in, uh, data that is available to you. So, these are very useful information for assembly processes. Now, we look at the basic soldering process and before that we need to understand what is a solder uh, and then how do you handle solders. So, solder wire is the most common form you can see here this is a, a solder wire that is available um, in different lengths, different diameters depending upon your requirement and today's solder wires come with flux coated. Earlier days we were having a flux as a separate entity and when you do hand soldering you will uh, use the flux separately to uh, wipe the areas on the board that is the copper areas and as you know flux has got uh, different uh, applications when we use them during assembly on a printed circuit board. Now, today solder wires it could be tin lead or tin or it could be other components like tin, silver, copper and so on. So, depending upon the material choice you can get the wires and if you carefully look at the data sheet you will see that 
it is filled with some kind of a flux component to ease the soldering process uh, and also uh, reduce the temperature of soldering and remove the oxides present on the printed circuit board surface. Solder wire is one thing you also get solder ribbons if you are looking at large area soldering or a large electromechanical component to be soldered. Then you have solder preforms. When you use a reflow soldering you are interested in using a solder paste. So, this is a micrograph you see here um, this is a micrograph <coughs> of a solder paste. So, you can see small granules um, very small fine particles of the conductor and this conductor particles are dispersed in a media typically an organic media like epoxy and this also contains flux a binder and so on. It will also some it will also contain some solvents uh, to keep the media intact until it is used. Therefore, it has to retain some kind of a viscosity um, for application as a syringe dispensing process or during a stencil printing process. So, you have to understand what kind of solvents are used so that you can um, dilute the material if you want in certain application. Um, and, and use it. Then there is another format in which solder is available and that is in the form of solder balls. So, typically as you know if you are using a BGA or a CSP the IO pads are typically in the form of a solder ball grid. Therefore, today in the market you have the availability of balls solder balls of various dimensions diameters and you could easily use them to repair your BGA or to make a new connection um, in your lab itself uh, of an existing BGA component in which a few solder balls have been damaged during repair and rework. So, the drivers for soldering process is typically in uh, large volume manufacturing or in an industry is the simplicity that it should provide and enhance the automation process to increase the throughput and then finally, in the product the yield should be very high with few defects and high reliability. And secondly an important thing is the right choice of material so that you can establish a low temperature soldering. Obviously, in electronic manufacturing you are concerned with the energy usage. Therefore, new materials should aid in being energy efficient. Therefore, solder materials that are being used today have to be considered from the point of view of um, low temperature so that you are saving in energy. The concerns with any new material or the soldering process in general is that reliability is an issue. You always have to understand reliability when you use a new material. If you are using an existing material then you have to go through the uh, previous experiences and data sheets or the experiences of various companies that have been using this material for a long time. One of the important things is corrosion, second is fatigue and the third is stress. Because when you look at a solder joint that is where all the failures take place in an electronic product. So, as I mentioned this example previously if you take a mobile phone and if you are dropping it a few times there is a failure. Now, the, the shock mechanical shock results in a fatigue or a crack at the solder joint resulting in an electrical open. Therefore, this is one example of a solder joint failure. And the other thing is due to thermal stress built up at the solder joint there could be load which can result in material stress and over period of time this will result in a failure. Here again the failure will be an electrical open or a short. Electrochemical corrosion or simply chemical corrosion is another example 
which can be noticed in electronic products. This can lead to weak solder joints or it can lead to new interface mechanisms that can be experienced or seen at the solder joint resulting in a weak joint or a dry joint or void created at the solder joint. So, fatigue of solder joints are very difficult to de detect. Um, you need to have a very good troubleshooting procedure to understand where exactly the failure has occurred and to understand how this failure has occurred. And failure of even a single joint could be catastrophic to the system. Therefore, uh, component choice is one thing, the board is another issue that is what kind of materials are you are using in the board and finally, the type of solder material that you are using along with the soldering process will lead to uh, understand the entire mechanism for a highly reliable product. Now, how to achieve a good solder joint? The basic conditions are there should be good wetting of the solder. So, if you look at a board uh, or a motherboard of a PC uh, or a typical product, uh, handheld product and if you look at the solder joints, the shining, the striking example is the shining nature of the solder joint. You have to look at the carefully through a microscope at the solder joints and see how well the wetting has taken place. Wetting ensures that your solder joint quality is good. The materials have um, reflown for example, or if in the case of a wave soldering, the wave, the molten wave of the material has adhered well to the through hole component and so on. So, good wetting uh, of the component along with the solder on the substrate is essential. The second thing is using the right amount of solder for the right amount of time at the right temperature. So, these three go in unison when you establish a joining process. So, let us look at what is wetting. Wetting refers to the spreading of the solder on the surface. Okay. There is surface tension that aids the uh, wetting process. Surface tension as we have seen even in the BGA self alignment, even if you do a misregistration, you are able to attain uh, or achieve a 100 percent yield because of the surface tension of the solder material uh, with the component pad and the substrate pad. So, here wetting refers to the spreading of the solder on the surface. Example, a drop of water on waxed paper does not wet. So, we do not want that kind of a situation and it should not wet on the dielectric material here. So, the dielectric should be free of the soldering material after the soldering process is complete. It could be a wave soldering process or it could be a reflow soldering process. A wetting is quantified by measuring the contact angle. Okay. So, if you look at uh, this particular example here in this illustration, this is the substrate okay, and then you have a certain amount of solder applied on the, on the metallic plate here. You can see a meniscus is formed and then the extent to which the material spreads on the surface is important. So, typically according to literature, it says this less than 15 degree uh, contact here as you can see here, this is known as the contact angle less than 50 degrees is good soldering because if it spreads too much again, it does not exhibit uh, good wetting. So, a host of um, environmental issues are at the site or the uh, status of the substrate, the metallic contact point is very important to establish a wet joint, especially for example, preparing the substrate before applying the solder. Let us look at materials that are considered wettable in this soldering process. The materials that have very good wettability are gold, tin lead, tin, silver and copper. 
uh, fairly good are bronze, brass, nickel and silver. Poor wettability, nickel iron, nickel alone, iron and zinc. Very poor wettability is aluminum, bronze, alloyed steels, aluminum etcetera and impossible to wet is chromium, magnesium, molybdenum, tungsten and so on. So, materials which are difficult to wet are those which are very quickly oxidized. Okay. So, materials uh, surface which gets oxidized in air quickly okay, and which have a very tenacious layer of oxide present on the surface uh, cannot wet. The same is the case with your printed circuit board. If you are not preparing the surface properly, even though you are using tin lead or tin or gold, then you can expect poor wettability. So, how is this solved? We use a material called flux. I mentioned earlier that today flux is present as an in, uh, ingredient in most of the solder materials um, of the shelf including wires or solder paste or solder balls. So, flux is a chemical formulation intended to perform the following functions. What does it do? Firstly, it removes the oxides which pose a great problem for us and which react with the solder material. It will form new interfaces, new intermetallic layers which can become very weak. So, that is why we say remove the oxides. Now, that itself is a very big topic to look at the intermetallic layers formed at the solder joints. Now, after cleaning the surface whether it is gold or copper or uh, tin lead or tin or tin silver copper, the surface has to be protected till the time it is soldered. Okay. So, typically we make sure that the oxides are removed from the surface. That is essentially the process that is depicted in this chemical equation here. Then the second important point or the uh, functionality of the flux is to assist transfer of heat from the source to the item when you do the soldering process because you want to di dissipate the heat quickly, you want to make sure that there is no heat build up during the component. Therefore, flux can aid in the transfer of heat and make a good wet solder joint. Thirdly, to allow transport of oxides and other products away from the area being soldered which is again uh, typically uh, a functionality that we have seen in the first point, but we have to make sure that the oxides are transported, but then these oxides have to be removed later by a cleaning process after the fluxing and soldering process is complete. Finally, the important thing is lowers the surface tension. So, it reduces the contact angle that is actually required for a good wet solder joint. So, we can understand that flux helps in improving the reliability of the board. The flux should be active enough, but it should not be corrosive. Certain flux materials if wrongly chosen can create uh, problems in the sense the flux material itself can um, introduce oxide materials or byproducts of fluxing process, which if it remains on the surface of the board after soldering and which if it is not cleaned or taken care of will create problems with corrosion. That means, they can act as very good nodal points and if they are present between two small tracks let us say. So, if there are products oxides uh, during its operation or during the lifetime of the product, this can act as a very good uh, bridge between the two tracks creating an electrochemical cell and therefore, this can end up in a shot. Therefore, the material has to be carefully chosen because as you see here, there are different materials available. What is an actual material used in a flux? It is called rosin to be differentiated from the word resin. Rosin in itself is a naturally available resin like your epoxy resin. This is an organic resin. It is available. Um, 
as an ingredient in all flux formulations. What are the types of flux? Firstly, you have uh, R flux which is called rosin flux um, basically containing abiotic acid. Okay. So, R A flux contains rosin activated flux that means there is an activator used. R M A flux stands for mildly activated flux, R S A flux stands for super activated flux that means the ingredients apart from the abiotic acid are different in each of these varieties. Then you have the water soluble flux and then you have a no clean flux. So, this development today in the materials concerning solder and flux activity is that you have what is known as a no clean flux which means when you use a no clean flux for the soldering process you can be sure that even if you do not clean the board you will not find any residues. So, the formulation is such that the byproducts after using this no clean flux will not re leave any residues on the board. So, basically the activation is done by adding some inorganic salts, uh, amines and so on. Now, let us come to the uh, equipment aspects of wave soldering. We have seen the process steps for a wave soldering, we have seen the process steps briefly for a reflow soldering process. We will also look at um, wave soldering equipment because if you want to do plated through hole technology um, even today in some cases it is being done using wave soldering. So, wave forms can be varied to prevent solder shorting during the soldering process. Solder shorting or solder bridging is a common defect that you will see um, in spite of the fact that um, the surface tension of the solder um, and the pitch of the component is a key concern in, in removing these kind of defects. What are the kinds of solder waveforms that you can see in equipment? It can be a jet wave, a broad wave which means the wave in itself the contact point here, the area available for the wave to touch the um, through hole component or the surface mount device is of great concern. It affects the reliability and the assembly. Therefore, you can in some equipments adjust the width of the wave. So, you can have a broad wave, a T wave, a delta wave and so on. So, these are different presentations available in different equipment. But generally if you look at the classification you can have a single wave which means you can see here there is a single wave and this is the board that travels like this and you can see a mixture of through hole components and you can also see surface mount devices. So, at one shot you can see the pins wicking the solder through the solder wave and also the surface mount devices getting attached. So, you can see at this point the soldering process is complete and this is the wave. Now, the same thing can be um, changed to ensure that in one pass of your board passing through the uh, equipment you can establish better reliability because in this case uh, there could be a chance that some of the components are not uh, soldered in the first pass itself. Therefore, you can have two different waves. Okay. So, to make sure that the components are completely attached. Now, there are other issues that concern with this like what should be the width of the first wave, what should be the width of the second wave and what is the time difference between the first wave and the second wave and so on. So, these are equipment considerations that one need to really adjust uh, considering the board density, uh, number of components, the type of components and so on including the thermal shock that can be taken by individual components when it is passed through two waves and so on. Now, we look at uh, a, a brief video clip on a wave soldering process. Once again I want to make sure that 
you understand the process steps for wave soldering. The first thing is if you are doing a complete 100 percent wave soldering process let us say for surface mount devices included glue dispense attach the component cure the glue or the adhesive completely then you introduce flux that can be present in the wave soldering equipment itself. You can have a foaming flux or a simple dip flux and so on and then you introduce into the soldering wave after that it is cleaned and tested. So, have a look at this uh, video where you can see that the board enters through the wave you can see the shiny wave okay, and then the board travels through the wave sometimes it is a double wave to ensure complete attachment in one pass. So, the time uh, you can see the video once again the time taken for the board to travel through the wave is determined by the component density uh, and the T g of the substrate and the quality of the wave, the height of the wave, the width of the wave and so on. So, it is a, a demanding process it requires careful consideration of all the process parameters. Now, what are the difficulties in SMD wave soldering? Now, we are assuming that uh, in some cases wave soldering will be used for surface mount devices. If you are using wave soldering for such a scenario, let us look at the possible difficulties. Components are immersed in hot solder, so that is a fact. Therefore, you have to make sure that the components do not experience heat shock for a longer duration. Line of sight of wave onto the solder pads is difficult because the pads are at different ends and there is a body uh, of the component. So, for example, this is the pad and this is the pad on which the component is attached through the glue here. Now, the wave has to be picked at the copper surface only then you can attach through surface tension on the molten wave. So, the line of sight is uh, difficult therefore, you can experience for example, if the board is moving this way uh, a very good attachment here, but probably a poor attachment on one side. So, how do you take care of that? Tall components cause a shadow for soldering. For example, in a board if you have a very tall component and then if you have a small component. So, how do you take care of attaching this component because you have to adjust the wave and make sure that the wave is dragged onto the copper pads. Fine pitch surface mount devices get solder shorting due to wave drag. So, here again as I mentioned the height of the wave uh, and the nature of the wave has to be carefully understood if you are using fine pitch surface mount devices. For example, if you want to use a QFP with fine pitch and if you are decided to use surface mount soldering then how do you take care of uh, solder bridging not being present after wave. Different wave profiles such as double wave, jet wave etcetera have only limited success. So, these are some of the points that probably uh, ensure um, in considering reflow soldering as a process for surface mount device rather than wave soldering. So, common defects in wave soldering uh, as a summary SMD component is moved out of correct position or completely gone because if your glue is not holding the component firmly because of the light nature of the surface mount devices and because of the molten wave sometimes it could be just plucked out or uh, dismantled from its position during the wave soldering process. The second point is there is no solder present between the component and the solder pad. Bridging between the component of close proximity if it is a fine pitch component and insufficient solder in joints.
okay. So, these are some of the defects. If you look at the defects that we have discussed pictorially, what is known as the component shadow effect? What is it? If you look at this picture here, there is a surface mount device here. This is the SMD device. You can see here the pad on the substrate, okay. Then there is a glue that holds the device and here you can see the wave. This is the wave of this wave soldering machine. Now, when the wave touches the substrate here, it touches the copper pad and due to surface tension, it pulls the solder and establishes a very good solder joint. But here you look at the height of the component, right. The wave is not in a position to be reached by this copper pad here. Therefore, there could be cases where this will end up with a no joint, no solder in the joint because it is in away from the line of sight of the wave. How do you overcome this? Instead of having a very small pad here, you extend the pad length during your design. So, that is why I keep saying that designers, if they can understand the manufacturing process, uh, it can end up in a very good um, design that could be yield, that could give a very good yield during assembly too. But many of many cases, the designers probably are not aware of these kind of design issues for manufacturing and therefore, it comes for some kind of a repair or some kind of a manual assembly even though the board has gone through uh, automated process. So, if you increase the or extend the solder land like this, now and this is the wave. Now, you can see that there is a, a good opportunity uh, even though this is a tall component. You can see the copper land drags the wave onto itself and establishes a very good solder joint and here again because this pad length is larger. Uh, due to surface tension, the wave is pulled on to the entire area of the copper pad and establishes a very good solder joint. So, these are very small design issues that can be considered by designers keeping assembly and manufacturing in mind. The other important thing when you are using small components and wave soldering is that the passives orientation has to be carefully considered. So, what is known as a good and bad placement? For example, if this is the orientation of the um, resistor or the capacitor, this is a single component. Now, if this is a two component, then you are probably going to experience um, difficulty in a good addition of the solder wave in the second component. Okay. So, there could be chances if the component is um, having a large profile or if the wave width is not ideal enough for attachment. So, when you place resistors in, in series, uh, you have to be careful. The prospect of attachment of the resistor or the capacitor when a tall component is used also has to be carefully considered. Do not keep the tall component uh, in line with your surface mount device because as I mentioned briefly, this could block the line of sight of the wave and you can expect poor soldering here. So, spread the tall component away from the smaller components like this to achieve very good uh, solder attachment. So, do not place short components close to the tall component, instead move them away from the path of the tall component. Now, what are the methods of doing reflow soldering? We have seen heat in a reflow soldering process is applied by infrared radiation. Equipments are available uh, for reflow soldering with IR, with thermal air, convection air and the third one is laser using YAG, yttrium aluminum garnet or carbon dioxide. So, these are typically for special applications. The picture that you are seeing here is a large volume manufacturing reflow equipment with multiple zones. So, typically 
it's a fairly large equipment uh, used for volume manufacturing. Here you can typically see, see many zones, it can have five different zones of uh, process okay, before the board comes out. So, it, the board is fed on one side and comes out through the other side after it is totally cooled to room temperature. In between you will see the equipment working at different zones of heating. So, we will see uh, in a short while uh, the thermal profile that has to be set for a reflow process and how do you take care of thermal shocks. So, once again I would like to emphasize the process steps for a reflow soldering is for surface mount devices displace the solder, dispense the solder paste, attach the component through a pick and place equipment, then do a tacky cure, here it is not fully cure, then you do the reflow process, clean and test, that will complete the reflow soldering process. In the case of a double side reflow, now here what I have mentioned is typically the process step for a single sided assembly, very simple, there are no major issues, only thing you have to make sure that the temperatures are set. But when you do a SMD assembly on the printed circuit board with SMD components on both sides, then you have some issues which if you take care will give you higher yields. The first concern is the component falling during the reverse side soldering. So, if you take a printed circuit board, you have the SMD assembly here, you have done the reflow on one side and then you are going to proceed for the reflow on the second side. So, what are the issues? Because you have to make sure that the first assembly done should not be disturbed and since you are using only a tacky cure, you have to make sure that the components are not disturbed from its coordinates during the second side reflow soldering process. So, if there is a concern because it is a reflow, so even the components that are attached on the first side, there could be a possibility that the reflow will take place and your solder paste will reflow and then the components can move from its coordinates and then if it is a very light component can even fall. So, to take care of that, on one side you can use adhesives. In addition to the solder paste, you can use an adhesive glue to make sure that the component does not fall during the second side assembly process. So, you have to take care of this issue in the design stage itself by carefully selecting the lighter components on one side only. Okay. So, otherwise if you have mix of components, then ensure that the assembly um, agency or the company or if you are doing it in house that you have used glue to make sure that the components, lighter components do not fall. The molten solder will hold the components more strongly due to surface tension. Contrary to the belief that the component will fall because the solder is uh, reflowed again, actual fact is that the molten solder will not allow the component to fall because of surface tension. So, but these are again reliability issues and if you want to make sure that you do not have to do a rework, then you can use a glue. Now, we will see different suggestive methodologies for doing reflow process, because in certain cases you will have to handle different types of components. Let us look at first type 1 dual reflow. So, what do you mean by that? There is a reflow process that is taking place and you have to do twice. So, it is a double reflow process and as I said and I keep emphasizing, make sure in the design stage itself whether your board material is suitable for a dual reflow. Otherwise, do not attempt a dual reflow. You can if you have the provision for having a larger board area, then you can um, assemble or design or do the layout for one side and end up with a single reflow. But today's boards are very complex, they are double sided, 
high density multi layer. So, dual reflow should really not be a problem provided the uh, parameters are maintained. So, how do you go about this? First thing is print the solder paste okay, on one side, place the SMD devices using a pick and place equipment and do the reflow. So, the first side is complete. Okay, so, you can see in this picture you have PLCC passive components and small outline devices on one side and on the other side you have again similar components let us say small outline QFP passive devices resistors capacitors uh, PLCC devices and so on. Now you invert the board so that we are now atten turning our attention to the second side invert the board print the paste again on the second side place the SMD devices on the second side then you do the reflow. Now the second side is also done so the second side is also reflowed. Note here we are not using any glue on the second side. Uh, we have to believe in the fact that the molten solder uh, generally if you maintain temperatures uh, will not allow the first side component to again reflow and fall. Now again there is a temperature gradient between the surface at the top side and the bottom side. Therefore, you are generally very safe in ensuring that the first side is not disturbed. So, generally this process is well established and ideally you do not require a glue for the second side. So, after that you do a cleaning and test. Cleaning would require to be done because you are using uh, flux and the flux residues have to be removed. So, you can do cleaning using isopropyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol or IPA as is as it is known um, and then it could be made dilute with water it is because it is miscible with water and therefore, uh, very safe material and then after it is dried in the oven after cleaning with isopropyl alcohol you can do your continuity test to establish that your solder joints are perfect. So, this is type 1 dual reflow. Type 2 A says that the primary process is reflow and the secondary process is wave. That means, here you have first process as reflow and the second process is wave. And if you look at the picture here, um, the kind of devices that are needed for this type of soldering is that there are through hole components here, dip package and so on. And on the same side that is the solder side of this, you have the SMD passive devices. On this side you can have the active devices like your small outline IC, PLCC and so on. So, the first side you print the solder paste, place the SMD devices, do a reflow. Okay. Then invert the board, apply the adhesive. So, here for this you have to apply the adhesive, place the SMD devices, cure the adhesive fully, full cure. Right. Now, you can invert the board, the SMD components are not going to fall. Invert the boards, manually insert plated through hole components like you see here. You invert the board, place the manual, uh, place manually the packages like dip and so on. Now, you introduce it this side for the wave. So, this side goes for wave and the top side goes for reflow. Okay. Then after that you clean and then test the board. So, this is how you do your placement and assembly for a board which contains through hole components very few in number, but largely surface mount device. <coughs> then you have type 2 B which says reflow primary is the first step and the second step is um, also reflow that means reflow primary and secondary and 
you do some part of it manual solder which is a, a minor component in this process. So, how do you go about print solder paste place SMD components reflow. So, this takes care of all your SMD devices. Then invert the board print solder paste place SMD components and reflow. So, this is again talks about SMD only. Then invert the boards manually insert through hole components and manual solder here we are not using wave, wave is not used. That means, the number of components here for um, through hole type is very small you are not adopting a wave process you are doing you are doing manual soldering process and finally, clean and test. So, this is known as type 2 B. So, this basically says that kind of components in each of these the first one you had um, complete SMD no through hole components. In the second one you had a few through hole components that require wave soldering and in the third type you have reflow primarily and then a couple of through hole components that can be managed with manual soldering. So, even in this case you can do manual soldering if you feel that the percentage of through hole components is much less. Then finally, we have type 3 which is known as wave secondary that is mostly it is a secondary uh, it is a wave soldering process. You can see from this figure here a lot of through hole components and a few passive devices in SMD format. So, insert leaded component okay, then you can bend it, then you invert the board these leaded components will not fall, apply the adhesive or the glue. So, that your SMD components can sit firmly and you cure it completely, so that they are firmly held on the board. Now, you invert the board manually insert through hole components Okay, and then do a, a single wave soldering process where all the through hole packages and all the wave all the lighter surface mount devices are attached by wave soldering process. Finally, you clean with IPA and then test it. So, this the focus here in this is wave soldering process where you are utilizing uh, leaded components probably machine based assembly and also manual insertion of heavy components and so on, but in a single wave soldering process the entire assembly is done. So, these are different types these are serving as guidelines for you in your prototyping or your large volume manufacturing. In the next class we will talk about uh, another important process called vapor phase reflow soldering process.